My name is Peter Daniel, I'm Education Officer at Westminster Archives. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Cato Street Conspiracy. Uh, we've set up a new website, catostreetconspiracy.org, and I'm hoping to look to get some volunteers to help put this website together. So what I'm going to begin doing is to try and tell the story and uh, show some of the images that we've got from Westminster Archives. In December 2019, Westminster Archives joined a partnership to mark the bicentenary of the Cato Street Conspiracy. Thanks to the Heritage Lottery Fund, we received 72,400 to mark 200 years since the West End job. On the night of the 23rd of February, 1820, the conspirators planned to leave their hideout in Cato Street, cross over Oxford Street towards Grosvenor Square to find the house of Lord Harrowby, where the cabinet were meant to be meeting for a dinner. Their aim was to enter the house and use grenades and swords to kill the whole of His Majesty's cabinet. The full cabinet were meeting at Lord Harrowby's house. That included famous figures like the Duke of Wellington, who was the master of ordnance, George Cannon, president of the Board of Control, Lord Eldon, the Chamberlain, Lord Sidmouth, who was the Home Secretary, who was cracking down on civil liberties at the time, and Lord Castlereagh, the Foreign Secretary, whose actions in Ireland had angered so many people and the public. These would all be in at the dinner and Thistlewood's men believed that they could kill them and destroy the government with one fatal blow. What Thistlewood and the conspirators were attempting was the same thing that Guy Fawkes had attempted in 1605 when he plotted to blow up the Houses of Parliament and kill the government and King James I to cut off the head of state in one foul sweep. Now, Cato Street is quite a difficult place to find. Even today, it's a concealed square. So people often ask whereabouts where it is. Well, it's in Marylebone um, and it's just off of the Edgware Road. Originally, on the map that we're looking at here, um, the street off the Edgware Road was known as Queen Street. It's now known as Harrowby Street. So very close to Cato Street was Portman Square. Now this was a place that the conspirators had to be careful of because of the Coldstream Guards. It was a barracks with foot soldiers who at any time could come and raid their secret hideout. So looking at the map here, you can see a close up of Cato Street. And it's clear here, you can see that on either side of the small square, there's two little alleyways that lead in. So it's very concealed and that's why you wouldn't be able to see it. Now, up above me, as these Ashbridge pictures show, the house at Cato Street was no more than a barn. Twenty, the building had been owned by an absent Indian army officer named General Watson. And it was hired out to one of the conspirators who had been a former soldier. His name was John Harrison. So John, why Cato Street? The reason I chose Cato Street was quite simple. When I came back from Peninsula War, I remember I was a lifeguard, I was out of work for some time, I still used to go and visit my old mates that were at King Street Barracks. So when the other conspirators said they were looking for somewhere to stay or somewhere to plot, I knew that Cato Street would be a great hideout. No one could ever find it, so that's the place we chose. 
So John, one thing doesn't really make sense about that. Um, why pick a hideout right alongside a barracks full of soldiers? That's plain daft. Oh, ye yeah, little thing. Do you think we hadn't thought of that? We had hand grenades. You see, what we were going to do on the night in question, we were going to go to King Street Barracks and bomb the stables. It wouldn't have been a problem. There were 27, well, round about that number, conspirators in that hayloft on that night on the 23rd of October, 1820. But the ones you see here, well, these are the main ones. So let them introduce themselves to you. I'm Arthur Thistlewood. Hello there. I'm John Brom. My name is George Edwards. My name's Richard Sid. I'm William Davidson. It's James Ings. What the conspirators didn't know is they never ever had any chance of success because one of their own, George Edwards, Thistlewood's number two, was an agent provocateur, a government spy who had fed every piece of information back to Lord Sidmouth so the project could never have succeeded. Edwards was not alone. Two other conspirators, Haydn and Dwyer, who had come very late to the conspiracy, had also betrayed all of the others. And two of them, Monument and Adams, once they were eventually captured, would also turn evidence King's evidence against all of the others, condemned five of them to their deaths. Two of the ministers were hated more than the others. This was Lord Sidmouth and Lord Castlereagh. And James Ings, a former butcher, planned to enter Lord Harrowby's house with two bags to take away their heads at the end of their raid. So why were they hated so much? Well, Percy Bysshe Shelley, who wrote Mask of Anarchy gives us an idea. Quoted his poem on Lord Sidmouth, he says, Clothed with the Bible as with light and the shadows of the night, like Sidmouth next hypocrisy on a crocodile rode by. So Sidmouth was seen as an hypocrite. What about Lord Castlereagh? Well, Shelley uses a very damning line on him. I met murder on the way, he had a mask like Castlereagh. Very smooth he looked yet grim, seven bloodhounds followed him. He was murderous and he was a hunter because in Ireland he would chased after the people who were seeking freedom. Both men were trying to crack down on civil liberties and so were seen as the two key targets for the conspirators. So what was this crackdown on civil liberties? Well, it was all linked to democracy. About six months before the Cato Street conspiracy, people in Manchester had protested against a lack of democracy and many of them had lost their lives, cut down by dragoons and men on horses. Ings had been so angered by this that he had planned to go into the house and use these words when he met the cabinet ministers. He said, I shall say, my lords, I have got as good men here as the Manchester Yeomanry. Enter, citizens, and do your duty. So the Cato Street conspiracy was also about revenge for what had happened at Peterloo, when 18 innocent people had been killed fighting for democracy. So as you can see from this wonderful image of the Cato Street conspirators from the Ashbridge collection, Thistlewood holds a sword aloft in one hand and the plan for the conspirators in the other. And it says in his hand, this is the plan for assassinating his majesty's ministers. Arthur Thistlewood had a five point plan for capturing the city of London. Well, once they'd left Grosvenor Square, they had to get the weapons to take over the city. And these were the cannons that were at Gray's Inn Road and at Finsbury Circus. Then it was to move on, capture the Bank of England, steal more weapons at the Tower of London and recruit the soldiers there, and then set their provisional government up at Mansion House, the home of the Lord Mayor of London. 
the conspirators, well, there were no, though they'd been former soldiers, there was no money involved. So they had to make their own weapons. They made their own pike heads, they made their own musket balls. And you can see it was a bit of a cottage industry. The National Archives still has some examples of some of the weapons that were seized afterwards and used for evidence in court. The cottage industry style of the conspiracy is probably best exemplified by this document from the National Archives. It's a recipe for making a bomb. Uh, don't make this at home, kids. I think that's what um, Blue Peter would have said. But here's the recipe. Take two ounces of resin, two ounces of mutton suet, two ounces of horse turpentine, melt together, add two ounces of saltpeter, make it into a ball with a fuse fixed in from the center, and hey presto, kaboom. Your cabinet's gone, the nation's overthrown, and revolution is here. Our partners at the National Archives have an encoded speech by a man called Thomas Preston, who was one of the conspirators who was never tried, but was a very close friend of Arthur Thistlewood, and they'd both been involved in the Spa Fields Riots of 1816 that had a similar idea of overthrowing the government and causing a revolution. The conspirators came to Cato Street on the night of the 23rd of October, 1820. So as you enter the ground floor of Cato Street and look around you, you can see it's very Spartan, it's very bare. This is not a residential property. This was a cow shed. Now you could say to yourself, what's a cow shed doing in Maribyrn? Well, the Maribyrn of 1820 is not the Maribyrn of 2020. Maribyrn 200 years ago was a semi-rural area. So having a cow shed in the vicinity, well, that wasn't that unusual. So you can see there are no stairs to the second floor. There's just a basic ladder. And this ladder was guarded on the night by two of the conspirators, Richard Tidd and William Davidson, both armed with blunderbusses and cutlasses, ready to stop anyone that they didn't want going to the second floor, getting into the building. Anyone who passed through that night had to give a password. They had to say those words, but, and ton, button, the secret password to get to the upper floors and meet T, the head of the conspirators, Mr. Thistlewood himself. A successful password allowed you to climb the stairs to the second level of the house at Cato Street. We're now on the upper floor of the house at Cato Street. There are two rooms up there and the one we can see now is the main room. As a large table, that holds the 27 conspirators. This is where they would have made their arms, their pike heads, or molded their musket balls from molten lead. It would have been very dark and gloomy. This was midwinter. There's no light streaming in from the windows at the side. All there is is candlelight. The light that they had had been obtained by William Davidson who had popped next door and asked for a light for his candle from a neighbor. It was really difficult then to try and get hold of a light because people were relying on a tinder box, not even a box of matches. So it would have been very dark on that particular night. You can also see on the table, a sheet of paper and a quill pen. Why was this here? Well, the conspirators were so poor, they couldn't afford to print posters to announce the revolution they hoped to begin on that particular night. So they were going to hand write their own bills. And thanks to our partners, the National Archives, we have one of those original handwritten bills that I'm going to read to you now. Britons to arms, break open all gun sword shops, pawnbrokers or other likely places to find arms. Run all constables through who touch a hand on us. No rise of bread. No castle ray, off with his head. No national debt. The whole country, 
wants the signal from London to fly to arms. Stand firm now or never. At eight o'clock on that particular night, Thistlewood gathered all the men in close to discuss their last preparations before they attacked Lord Harrowby's house at Grosvenor Square. It was at that moment when noises below warned them that something was afoot. From the stairs approached two Bow Street runners. One of them was the leader, George Ruthven. He announced, we are peace officers, lay down your weapons. And with that, the second Bow Street runner, Richard Smithers, drew his cutlass and moved towards Thistlewood. Thistlewood took a step back, drew his cavalry sword and ran Smithers through, who gasped for last, oh, I'm done for, and then collapsed, dying to the ground. Knowing that their plot was over, Thistlewood announced, extinguish the lights, and everything went black. Two of the conspirators moved into the back room. They were John Harrison and Robert Adams, and they escaped through the window and across the snowy, ice-frozen landscape into the dark of the night. Thanks to our Heritage Fund, Michael Foreman, a leading author and illustrator, created a picture of Adams and Harrison's escape across those icy rooftops. So what was left behind in the barn was a single hat laying on the floor, abandoned by one of the conspirators. Between them, the Bow Street Runners and the Coldstream Guards only managed to capture nine of the conspirators. What all 27 didn't know was that they had been set up by the agent provocateur, Edwards. There was no subtlety in the setup. Lord Sidmouth, the Home Secretary, already had the wanted posters, adverts already prepared. This one here shows that in the London Gazette, a reward for a thousand pounds was already prepared for the leader of the Cato Street conspiracy. This was a reward that would never have to be paid out because Edwards had already told Sidmouth where Thistlewood would try to hide out. It was in Whitecross Street in Moorfields and the Bow Street runners burst in the following morning and found him still clothed, still with his cutlass and his blunderbusses under the bedclothes, captured, ready to be tried. A fleet of taxis took the conspirators to Whitehall to be interrogated by the cabinet themselves, who gloated over their success. After that, they were not all kept together in the same place. They were taken to three separate prisons. Two of the prisoners were not actually captured at Cato Street. Thomas Preston, a friend of Arthur Thistlewood, a political agitator, and Thomas Hazard, a school teacher, who had supplied the Maryland Union reading rooms that the conspirators had met discussed their political objectives, these two were taken to Tothill Fields Bridewell in Westminster. Conspirators Strange, George and Simmons were taken to Cold Bar Fields Prison in Clerkenwell. This was known to Londoners as the Bastille, which reminds all of us of the French Revolution, a place in London where the revolutionaries England Eight of the conspirators were taken to the Tower of London, the place where those who showed treason against the crown were traditionally taken. This was Thistlewood, Brunt, Harrison, Davidson, Ings, Wilson, Tidd, and John Monument, the man who within the tower would be convinced by his interrogators to turn evidence against all of his fellow conspirators. William Davidson, was actually kept in a prison cell above Traitor's Gate, a place traditionally associated with those who had turned against their country. All of the prisoners were eventually taken to Newgate Prison and thence to the Old Bailey for their trial. At the end of the trial, Lord Chief Justice Abbott 
announced that five men were guilty of treason. These were Thistlewood, Brunt, Ings, Kidd and Davidson. Lord Chief Justice Abbott announced that all five of them should be taken to the place from whence they came and afterwards be drawn upon a hurdle to the place of execution, where they should be severally hanged by the neck until they were dead. Their heads should be severed from their bodies and their bodies to be divided into four quarters to be at the disposal of His Majesty. Lord Chief Justice Abbott decided not to include the full sentence for treason, which was not abolished to 1870. This would have included being cut down alive, having their privy members cut off in front of them and their bowels taken out and burned before them. Perhaps the terror of this particular sentence made Wilson, Harrison, Bradburn, Strange, Gilchrist and Cooper decide to plead guilty and throw themselves on the mercy of the court. One of the tragic stories of the Cato Street Conspiracy was that of James Gilchrist, a former soldier in the Napoleonic Wars. He'd come back to London and found himself starving. On the night of the Cato Street Conspiracy, he'd heard that he could get bread and cheese and food at the Cato Street hideout. He turned up there and he found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. He'd been captured and accused of treason. His hunger for bread and cheese could have cost him his life in the most horrific of manners. The execution of Thistlewood, Ings, Tidd, Brunt and Davidson was set at Newgate for the 1st of May, 1820. By tradition, those guilty of treason would be dragged to their execution on a hurdle, on a sledge. But Lord Sidmouth was terrified that this could provoke the huge crowds that were expected, so this was dispensed with. A huge platform was built outside Newgate Prison and barriers were put in place to hold the crowds back. The lifeguards and other soldiers were brought into the area to hold the crowds back because the cabinet were worried. At this moment, London would be a dangerous place where the revolution would once more take place. Eventually, the time for execution came. The men were led onto the gallows. They had to lead down from the steps from the prison onto the wooden platform. When Richard Tidd did this, he tripped on the lower step and staggered across the gallows. When the crowd saw this, Tid almost dancing across the wooden platform, they cheered and Tid took this as they were cheering him, bowed to all four corners of the crowd. James Ings watching decided that this was the way he wanted to go out too. So he came onto the platform, he sang, he cheered, he danced, but he provoked no reaction from the crowd who had been moved further away so as no reaction could be provoked. Traditionally, those executed have the opportunity of giving their last words. Thistlewood calmly showed that he had no regrets. His last words, Albion is still in chains of slavery. I quit it without regret. I hope the world will be convinced that I have been sincere in my endeavours, and I die a friend of liberty. My motives? I doubt not, and will hereafter be justly appreciated. He believed he would be seen in the right by posterity. Ings, as we said before, went out with a song, a song that had a particular line, give me death or liberty, and he followed it with the final Remember me to King George, and God bless him. The watch in John Camp Hophouse, who was sympathetic to the conspirators, laughed that Ings could never hold a tune, and perhaps it was best he hadn't sung. Liberty or death had become a rallying cry in the 
the time of the American War of Independence. It originally stemmed from a 1713 play called Cato, a tragedy about the Roman Republican who stood up against Caesar at his death fighting for liberty. Each of the five condemned men had the noose placed around their neck by the executioner, generically known as Jack Ketch. They were then taken onto the gallows, hung by the neck until they were dead. Afterwards, they were cut down and a masked figure, nobody knew who he was, removed each of their heads one at a time with a surgical knife. After each occasion that they did this, the head would be lifted and the executioner would cry, this is the head of, and then mention that they were traitors to the king. By the last, happened to be beheaded, John Thomas Brunt, the executioner, quite comically dropped the head of Thomas Brunt across the gallows. He'd cried, this is the head of John Thomas Brunt. Oops, the head had gone. One person in the crowd cried out, Oi, Butterfingers, which brought the tragedy comedy end to the conspirators' execution. The families of the conspirators did not have the opportunity to bury their loved ones. The pre-prepared pine coffins were taken back into the prison and buried in an unmarked place with quicklime to remove any trace conspirators to make sure no shrine was ever put up in place of those to threaten the crowd. Of the 11 men tried at the Old Bailey, 10 were found guilty and their wives and dependents were now destitute. 29 children faced losing a father. So when appeal was put out, subscription to try and support this tragic victims of the Cato Street Conspiracy. Five of the ten guilty men were not executed. The reason? They had pleaded guilty. And for their guilty plea, their sentences were commuted to transportation to Australia, to Van Diemen's Land, on the other side of the world. The government was frightened these five men could become symbols of revolution. So after the trial and the execution, they were hurriedly taken to Portsmouth and put on the transportation ship Guildford and taken on the long journey to Australia, which would take them 129 days. Here is the original ship's log, which shows five conspirators marked out, as you can see in the corner, as the Cato Street conspirators. It's very dangerous criminals who had to be closely watched. John Cam Hobhouse, friend of Arthur Thistlewood and the conspirators, watched their execution with his son and afterwards went to the pub where they had regularly met, White Lion, Mick Street and Covent Garden. There, Nell Bristow, the landlady, was pulling pints at the bar. She looked downtrodden, she looked sad. A widow, she depended on the trade of the conspirators and was sand and now, 10 of them at least, never returned to her pub. But who does she have sympathy for? Not for the five that were executed. She felt for the five that were being transported. A fate, she thought, was far worse than death. What then was the fate of the Cato Street conspirators who were transported to Australia? Well, on the whole, most of them settled down to life. Wilson, Harrison and Strange even became police constables in Bathurst and seemed like reformed men. Carpenter Richard Bradburn, however, escaped soon after he got there. He was recaptured and then settled down to life. All of the men, apart from Charles Cooper, had been married when they'd been in London. 
Many had children. They hoped to bring them back to Australia with them. And the time came when they asked their spouses. None of them fancied the 129 day journey. So all of these men remarried and effectively had two families on either side of the world. Many people see the conspirators now as misguided, crazy even, to have attempted to overthrow the establishment. But all of them sincerely believe they were trying to bring about a change for the better for their fellow Britons. They were prepared to die what they were hoping for would be greater freedom. Liberty or death had been the cry of James Eames at the gallows. It's what introduced this particular video with Vince Burke's modern interpretation of that song. We'll end it with the version that was contemporary to 1820, sung by Ruby Day. Was happy in my native land, I boast my country's charter. I'll never basely lend my hand. Her liberties to barter. The noble mind is not at all by poverty degraded. Tis guilt alone can make us fall, and well I am persuaded. Each freeborn Briton song should be, or oh, give me death or liberty. 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 So as I said at the beginning, if you're interested in being involved in this project and helping to put together our website, www.catostreetconspiracy.org.uk, please get in touch with Peter Daniel at Westminster Archives on pdaniel at westminster.gov.uk or call 0207 641 5182.